He's a graduate of the Memphis School of Preaching in 2004. He has been preaching full-time since then. Many of us know him personally. He has been to Singapore multiple times. In fact, I, I was, uh, you were saying that he had been here for every lectureship except 2020 when there was a, because of COVID, it was cancelled. And so he is no stranger to many of us. We know he is well qualified to speak and we are ready to listen to him to speak on the topic of the wife and the mother. It is once again my pleasure to stand before you and preach on such a timely topic when you consider all the things that are going on in our world and how our world is trying to re-identify our, our homes. When you stop and you give consideration to what uh, people are now accepting as good and honorable in their sight, maybe much like the book of Judges, where they said there was no king in Israel and every man did that which was right in his own eyes. Giving consideration to the home, as Brother Bland said just a moment ago, when you stop and think about it, we give so much reverence and respect to the church because it's a divine institution that was purchased with the blood of Jesus. But we oftentimes forget that the home is the very first divine institution that God created. He took the male and the female and he brought them together, giving them charge to live as one flesh. But at the very same time, he gave them the responsibility to be fruitful and multiply. And from that standpoint, we began to see the creation of godly mothers and godly wives, godly husbands and godly fathers. My responsibility during uh, this time is to speak on the godly wife and the godly mother as defined in the scriptures. I'm going to tell you on the front end, I feel inadequate. I feel inadequate because when you look at the position that God has given to these women of being a godly mother and a godly wife, it is absolutely amazing what they can do. It, it baffles my mind how strong they are. It, it just absolutely just intrigues me to, more, to know more about their emotions, to know just how they can do so much with so little. And yet, when you look at the result of godly children being raised, you begin to see the most beautiful thing that mankind could ever know here on this earth. And that is souls being brought to Jesus because of their very first influence of their mother. Having made the choice to be a wife and a mother a woman must give herself gladly to the work of the home so she will not give the enemies of the cause of Christ reasons or opportunities to bring reproach upon her life. Now we need to understand this doesn't mean that, a, that she is to be chained to her house, uh, a prisoner in her own home, but rather just like the worthy woman of Proverbs chapter 31 she actively engages in endeavors outside the home, but her focus will always be on her family. In this position as a godly mother and a godly wife, she is going to find glory and fame and great blessings, and not as the world looks at it, but, but as God does, as her husband does, as her children do. And they're to be found in her role as a godly mother and a godly wife. The wise man Solomon once wrote in Proverbs 31, beginning in verse 28, her children arise up and call her blessed. Her husband also, and he praiseth her. Many daughters have done virtuously, but thou excellent, but thou excellest them all, excel, excellest them all. Favor is deceitful and beauty is vain, 
but a woman that feareth the Lord, she shall be praised. April 12, 1986, 2 o'clock in the afternoon. I was standing at the end of an aisle in a church building, and the back doors of the church building opened. And there stood the most beautiful thing I'd ever seen in my life. She was walking toward me, and it was like my life flashed before my eyes knowing that the rest of my life is going to be spent with this beautiful, godly woman. This woman who would promise herself to me and I to her. And while that occasion in my life is probably not important to you, but it's everything to me. But if you were to give the same occasion to to that time in your life or even look forward to that time in your life, that would be the most important occasion to you other than perhaps your obedience to the gospel of Jesus Christ. But it would be second only to that day. When we think of a godly woman and a, a godly wife and a godly mother, we look at a woman who will put God first in everything that she will put God first in everything. Her relationship with God will always take precedent over any other relationship. And I'm so thankful for that. In the sense that even when you look at Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, when he said, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you, showing that the relationship and the fellowship that we can have with God, that the sustenance and, and him providing those things in which we are going to need to live in this physical life, it, it, that's going to demonstrate our faithfulness and by putting him first place. And when you put that in the position of a godly wife and a godly mother, how much stronger is the husband going to be? How much stronger is the children going to be? When you think about what Jesus said in Luke chapter 14, beginning in verse 26, if any man come to me and hate not his father and his mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters, yea, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Luke 14, 26. The word hate there, as we see in the King James, literally means to love less. So, so somebody's going to be second place because God's going to always be first in the mind of all Christians. But today, as we begin to t talk about the, the godly wife and the godly mother, God will be first in her mind, in her actions, in all that she does. I'm going to invite you to open your Bibles to 1 Samuel chapter 1. And I want you to look with me, if you will, at the example of, of Hannah. When we think about Hannah being the godly mother, at first she had found out she was barren. She couldn't have children. Although she desired a man-child that she could love, that she could commit to God. To have a child was the most important thing in her life. And when you look at 1 Samuel chapter 1, beginning at verse number 12. And it came to pass as she continued praying before the Lord, that Eli marked her mouth. Now Hannah, she spake in her heart, only her lips moved, but her voice was not heard. Therefore Eli thought she had been drunken, and Eli said unto her, How long wilt thou be drunken? Put away thy wine from thee. Now notice Hannah's response. And Hannah answered and said, No, my Lord. I am a woman of a sorrowful spirit. I have drunk neither wine nor strong drink, but have poured out my soul 
before the Lord. Count not thine handmaid for a daughter of Bilal. For out of the abundance of my complaint and grief, I have spoken hitherto. Then Eli answered and said, Go in peace, and the God of Israel grant thee thy petition that thou hast asked of him. Now she had gone to the temple to pray. She had gone to the temple to ask God to open her womb so that she might have a man-child. With a sorrowful spirit that she bows before the very throne room of God and makes this request. But the idea is here that she put God first and the fact is that, that through this we're told that she poured out her soul or she poured out her heart and laid it at the feet of God. Only people who put God first do such a thing. I remember growing up with a mother who was a godly mother, a godly wife. I remember as a teenager when, you know, we thought we were 10 feet tall and bulletproof. You know, nothing could hurt us at all. And so there would be times, especially when we got our driver's license and and, and we were able to take the car out for the very first time, and we would go uh, out and not get in trouble, but just do what teenagers do and hang out with their friends and that sort of thing. But I remember coming home, and it would be right at curfew time, or we'd get as close to it as we possibly could. And I remember walking in, and my father worked midnights most of my life. So he had left to go to work, and... I came home, and I remember saying hello to my mom. She had stayed up and, and, and or waited, waited up for me. And I remember walking down the hall to my bedroom and forgetting something. I was going to go back out to the car, and I remember her on her knees in our living room uttering a prayer of thankfulness that I came home safely. I know she prayed when I left, but she prayed when I came home. What would we do without godly mothers to bring our petitions and supplications before God, or at least on our behalf, and understanding? Here was Eli looking at Hannah and saw that she was pouring out her soul before the Lord. He didn't hear her voice, and he automatically thought this is a drunken woman, and the fact that she had taken some sort of uh, fermented wine or strong drink, and, and she, he was completely wrong because he didn't recognize, perhaps, someone who was trying to draw so close to God. He said in verse 16, For out of the abundance of thy complaint and grief, she said, I have spoken hitherto. Well, Eli told her the, the results, didn't he? He said, Go in peace, God of, uh, the God of Israel, grant thee thy petition that thou hast asked. Uh, God had heard her prayer. But God only hears the prayers of the righteous. His ears are over to their sayings or his ears are over to their words. And the fact is that those individuals who would come before God in this faithful state. We need to understand that prayer changes things. Our godly mothers and our godly wives need to understand that prayer changes things. The Bible tells us, confess your faults one to another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. James 5 and verse 16. The effectual fervent prayer has a connotation of something on fire that produces energy. That a fervent prayer would be, have so much heat or so much, uh, it would be so hot that it would produce a, a sense of energy as it lifts up and goes toward God. And that God would certainly hear those of the faithful. But the Bible tells us, For the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous, and his ears are open unto their prayers, but the face of the Lord is against them 
that do evil. Godly mothers and godly wives, they put God first. They put God first. But a godly wife and a godly mother will love her husband. She will love her husband. Love is the summation of all the wife should be and do. In Titus chapter 2, we see some great instructions for the older women or the aged women to teach their younger women. The idea that is after her relationship with Jesus, her consideration for her husband and her relationship to him will always be first in her thoughts. When you look at the aged women mis uh, listed there in Titus chapter 2 beginning in verse number 3, here Paul writes, the aged women likewise, that they be in behavior as becoming holiness, not false accusers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things, that they may teach the young women to be sober, to love their husbands, and love their children. That's a great responsibility that God has taken the aged women, that they would be able, through their experience, and through their knowledge of the scriptures, would be able to impart such that the younger would be able to be brought forth and that there would not ever be a generation lacking of young ladies knowing what they need to do as godly wives and godly mothers. The idea of being able to take such an experience and be able to impart that is incredible. When you look at the way that God in, in, in created the home, when he took the male and the female and he brought them together, uh, by the time you get through the book of Genesis, you begin seeing the entire, entire earth being populated through the relationships of the male and the female and all the homes that are going to be established throughout the, the history of time that God would lay forth instructions that there would never be a gap and what the instructions of how to love your husband and how to love your children. Again, we can talk about the emotions. Uh, the child comes into the world or uh, the, the husband is waiting on his bride to come down and we understand she's walking toward him to give her life to him in this way of the bonds of holy matrimony. We understand the emotions that go along with that. But it's much more than that. She also would understand that she is to be a companion to her husband. In order to love him, she must be a companion to him. In Genesis chapter 2 and verse 18, and the Lord God said, it was not good that man should be alone, and I will make him a helpmate. I will make a helpmate for him. The idea in this helpmate is not someone that would stand in front of him or stand behind him but would stand beside him. God took a rib from Adam's side. And that empty place was going to be replaced by the woman. I, I used to uh, preach on Mother's Day, and I would go to this, this passage, Genesis chapter 2, and, and I, would, I would talk about how God would take that rib and... and, and and create uh, the, the woman and say, this is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. And, and they too would be one twain. And take that, that word woman and, and break it into two syllables. And it's, whoa, man. <laughs> Thinking, oh, God did something pretty special here. That Adam would be able to call her woman that God would give her the proper name to carry this. But she's going to reverence her husband. 
loving and lovingly submit to, to him in everything that is right. Notice 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 3. But I would have you to know that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of every woman is man, and the head of Christ is God. 1 Corinthians 11, 3. Now, we have to understand that God has taken the woman and placed her in a very beautiful and responsible position. That she is going to be the second in command in this family unit. That she's going to stand beside the, her husband, but the husband is the leader. Again, not as a dictator or a tyrant, because if he's carrying out his role as a godly husband, then he is going to love her as Christ also loved the church. That gives her the desire to honor him and to reverence him, but also to be subject to him. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 33, Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife as himself, and the wife see that she reverence her husband. Reverence. To hold in high esteem. To lift him up to a position above her. In the sense, again, not as a dictator, but rather that she loves him and honors him and respects him so much that she's thankful for the position that God has given him and the position that God has given her. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as it is fit in the Lord. Colossians 3 and verse 18. The idea of submission here. We look at this sometimes and we reference it to the relationship between a slave and a master. Well, the only master is Jesus Christ. God has placed the husband as the leader in the home, the head of the wife, but not her master. But rather, he is her helper in the sense that he protects her and that he brings her along with him. And so she submits to him in everything that's right. whether it be through the daily routines of the home, through things like finances, through the raising of children, through discipline, through any other act that needs to take place in the home, that she's there to support him in that very thing. The wife is no more dishonored being in subjection to her husband then the church is dishonored in being subjection to Christ. And so she's in a beautiful place where God wants her to be. But she should desire that position because it's an honorable and worthy position. Just like the worthy woman in Proverbs chapter 31. But not only does a godly wife and mother love her husband but a godly wife and mother loves her children. A godly wife and mother loves her children. Uh, go with me back to 1 Samuel chapter 1. And notice the, again the example of, of Hannah. We back up to verse number 9. And so Hannah rose up after she had eaten in Shiloh and after they had drunk. Now Eli the priest sat upon a seat by the post of the temple of the Lord. And she was in bitterness of soul, and prayed unto the Lord, and wept sore. And she bowed a vow, said, O Lord of hosts, if thou wilt indeed look on the affliction of thy handmaid, and remember me, and not forget thine handmaid, but will give unto thine handmaid a man-child, then I will give him unto the Lord all the days of his life, and there shall no razor come upon his head. And so she makes this vow to God. And in this particular place, she goes to the temple and she's in bitterness of soul. The idea that she's grieving so heavily for not being able to have a child. And because of this, she bows before God. And how serious do you think that Hannah was 
because she wanted a child to love so dearly. That she wanted a child that she could love completely. This had nothing to do with materialism, but had everything to do with her service to God. She vows this vow. She remembers her adversary and promises that no razor is going to come upon his head. This is a Nazarite vow. And then you begin to see that that her desires have overtaken her so much that if God would provide provide this man child that she would love this child like no other child. But then again, that's what mothers do. They love their children like no other child. Uh, my wife is part of a foundation that it, it's a nonprofit foundation and it was started a number of years ago a preacher friend of ours, he and his wife were not able to have children. And so they they were trying to help raise money for them to adopt a child. They were not able to have children, and yet they had all this love to give and were not able to take the love that they would have for a child and, and give it away. So my wife, along with some other ladies, began just raising money on their own. Uh, something separate, you know, from, from the church altogether. But, but the idea was that they were going to help this couple with uh, the first initial payment. It was very expensive. And I think that they were able to help with about $5,000, which is about a fourth of what they needed to actually adopt a child. After they were able to do that, they thought that they would continue on and they developed this foundation, this nonprofit foundation. It's called a home for Jolie. And I'm not here to promote it, but just to, just to make it, uh, show an example. That here was this couple that were unable to have a child, and yet this mother, we watched her grieve every time the doctors told her that there was no hope of having a child. But once they were able to drive to Texas and adopt this little girl, Jolie, that to watch this child grow up under the influence of a godly mother and a godly father, knowing the home from which she came would have offered her no hope under that situation. That's the, why the importance when we look at the world out here and we see homes all over, we see mothers and we see fathers. But sometimes they're just mothers of the child and not mothers to the child, as Brother Bland said earlier, or fathers of the child and not fathers to the child. The idea is that mothers have this natural instinct within them that they want to give this away. And so when you see Hannah pouring out her soul in prayer at the temple and to see her heart being poured out and only her lips moving there's no wonder that Eli saw her drunken but jump to verse 24 and, and, and watch what happens after this the demonstration of this love in verse 24 and when she had weaned him she took him up with her with three bullocks and one ephah of flour and a bottle of wine and brought him unto the house of the Lord in Shiloh and the child was young. And they slew a bullock and brought the child to Eli. And she said, O my Lord, as thy soul liveth, my Lord, I am the woman that stood by thee here, praying unto the Lord. For this child I prayed, and the Lord hath given me my petition, which I ask him. Therefore also I have lent him to the Lord as long as he liveth. He shall be lent to the Lord. And he worshiped the Lord there. 
We talk about loving our children. And when you see a godly mother, a godly mother's love is not filled by a full toy basket. It's not filled with all of these material possessions. But a godly mother's love for her child is only filled when she influences that child to know who the Lord is and what the Lord is offering him or her. When we take into consideration that the love for our children is to bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Ephesians chapter 6 Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor thy father and thy mother, which is the first commandment with promise, that it may be well with thee, and thou mayest live long on the earth. But ye fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. How much do you love your children? You godly mothers, how much do you love your children? I know you desire to provide for every physical need that they have. But what about their spiritual needs? Do you love them enough to introduce them to God? A godly mother, a wife and mother, teaches her children. She teaches them to love God. Let me give you an example. I was going to use my wife throughout this whole thing because I think that she's the most godly woman, godly mother, and godly wife I've ever known. But I have to use this example because when our children were very young, my wife would be very diligent in just taking everyday occurrences and trying to teach them about God. And I remember standing outside of our laundry room one day, and she had my son and my daughter in there, and they were, she was teaching them how to wash clothes. You know, you don't put the whites in with the colors. You don't use hot water on, uh, on, on, on the uh, colored clothing and so on. And so she had all of that separate. But she was doing some spot treatment, and she took a piece of material, whether it was a pair of pants or or shirt, and she had this spray bottle, and she was treating the spot. And she began to teach them that that's what sin is like. It's a spot on our soul. And so she would treat that and rub it in real well, and then she would immerse it into the water of the washing machine. And then she would take them back out and bring, or bring them back in after the wash was finished. And she would open it up, she would pull that shirt or those pair of pants out, and she would say, see, the spot is gone. We immersed it in the water so it can be washed away. Now, as a father, I would have never thought of that. <laughs> but, but a mother did. She would also, when we would bring young children and, and she would babysit in our, in our home, she would teach them how to sing with them and sing songs about God and, and uh, sing his praises with these young t children, much like we do in our cradle roll classes and such. As a father, I, I, I wouldn't know how to do that. But when you think about what the Bible tells us, the importance of teaching our children about God, in Deuteronomy chapter 6, a passage that's probably very familiar with you, but the idea is when you look at the book of Deuteronomy, this is the second giving of the law, and that they are closely being prepared to go over Jordan and into the promised land, the entire new generation has risen up that has not died in the wilderness. And so this generation has to know what God expects of them. And so in Deuteronomy chapter 6, beginning in verse 4, 
Here Moses writes, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy might. And these words I have commanded thee this day that thou uh, shalt be in thine heart, and thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children, and shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, and when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up, and thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thy hand, and thou shalt be as frontless between thine eyes, and thou shalt write them on the post of thy house and of the gates. And it shall be written when the Lord thy God shall have brought thee into the land which he swore unto the fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, to give thee great and godly cities which thou buildest not. God wanted the children to be taught. Evidently at a very early age. The fact is that everything about their lives, when they would sit in their house, when they would rise up, when they would walk in the way, as a matter of fact, even the, the house itself would represent the law of God and the fact that the, the law would be written on the doorposts of the house as a reminder of who this house serves. A godly mother more than likely is going to be the very first Bible teacher that our children ever know. And they're going to do it with great diligence because they see the importance of that soul while pure at this infant stage. We also understand that they're going to grow up and if healthy, they're going to continue to grow and they're going to be accountable to God. And they need to know without a shadow of a doubt everything that God expects of them. The Bible tells us an example of this when Paul is considering Timothy. And he says that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures which was able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. 2 Timothy 3 and verse 15. The young preacher Timothy had a mother and a grandmother that spent much time with him in the scriptures. Not just the growing up in the house of, well, that's just what God says but showing them why God has said it. Even today, you can see many adults in our assemblies. When if you were to ask the question, I asked this question the other day in one of the Bible classes. I said, you know, we don't use instruments of music in our worship services. And I said, can you tell me why? And one man raised his hand and he says, there's no authority for it. Well, is he right? Well, yeah, he's right. And I said, why is there no authority for it? No one can answer that question. Again, that's the reason why our congregation is, uh, for this year, we've gone back to the first principles. If I tell my child that, that God says there's no authority for it, what are they going to learn? Well, there's no authority for it. But not why. Oh. And, and so the idea of the mother teaching her child that within the home that she has the greatest opportunity to unpeel the word of God and, and peel it back in such a way that they can easily see what God expects of them in preparing for their lives. You see that in Timothy, but also in 2 Timothy chapter 1, beginning in verse number 5. He says, when I call to remembrance the unfeigned love that is in thee, which dwelt first in thy grandmother Lois and thy mother Eunice, and I am persuaded that in thee also, wherefore I put thee in remembrance that thou stir up the gift of God, which is in thee by the putting on of my hands. By the putting on of my hands. The idea is that he had such an influence by two generations of women godly women, godly mothers that they would be able to impart to him from a very early age. But not only that, the love that was in them would be in him also. We talked earlier about the idea of love was the summation 
of a, of a wife and her relationship to her husband. And certainly that has to be a love that is, is more than just emotions, but based upon the knowledge that God has given us. The idea of the godly wife and mother who teaches her chief children, she teaches them to love God. But she also teaches them to be prepared for the future. She teaches them to be prepared for the future. In Proverbs 22 and verse 6, the Bible says, Train up a child in the way that he should go, and when he's old, he will not depart from it. Proverbs 22 and verse 6. Now, we need to understand that this is not an absolute in the sense that it's a 100% guarantee that we do everything that we need to do in training up these children as godly mothers that they're not going to depart from the truth because there'll come a day in time where they're accountable for their own souls and they will be free moral agents just as you and I. But it's less likely they will. But they'll also know what they're leaving if they do. And they'll know and take into consideration the severe consequences if they do. Also in Proverbs 29, verse 15, the rod and reproof give wisdom, but a child left to himself bringeth his mother to shame. Proverbs 29, verse 15. I lived in a house where th this was a common saying growing up in the United States that when uh, a child usually was at home with his or her mother and, and he would get in trouble and the mother would say, you just wait till your father gets home. And that's supposed to just instill fear because uh, the father was not going to spare the rod. I grew up in a house. My mother never had to say that because she had a rod of her own. <laughs> and if I was lucky, she wouldn't tell my father after he got home because I'd get a second rod. I remember John D. Berry talking about the disrespect uh, or the, the time that he disrespected his, his mom. He, he came home. He had been at football practice all day. He walks into the house, and he has these football shoes on. And his mother told him as he came in the door, she said, you take those shoes off in my house. And he thought he was a man, and he went on through the house and tracked dirt all the way through. And he goes, and he lays on his bed, and he's listening to music or something, and then his father comes home. And his father says, what do you mean disrespecting my wife? He said, suddenly my mother went from being my mother to his wife. And he said he's never forgotten the beating that he got that day. I remember also growing up, that my mother made sure that we knew right from wrong. Some kids in our neighborhood had influenced me, I will say, that our next door neighbor had these stepping stones leading up to her house. And we had this idea that we were going to take a hammer and we were going to break up those stepping stones. I don't have any idea why. But I remember breaking up those stepping stones, and I remember getting a whooping from my mom and a whooping from my dad after he got home and whooped me, and then we had to go buy more stepping stones to replace those. To this day, I do not like to step on a stepping stone. <laughs> but our mothers teach us so much we probably learn what love is through them. They're the first ones to hold our hands. They're usually the first ones to give us a hug. They're the first ones to show compassion. The mothers are usually first in everything in a young child's life. And if she's carrying the torch of the Word of God, how much more were the benefactors of living under such an influence? Godly mothers do so much for us. 
Godly mothers and husbands will put God first. They will love their husbands. They will love their children. And then they will continually to teach their children the ways in which they should go. For the future before them will certainly be uncertain, but that they will be under the control and direction of an almighty God. Thank you very much for your attention this morning.